Uh, the venting that you see on screen is totally normal. That is just some Stage of... Stage one, RP-1 load is complete. Great news there, that RP-1 load is now finished. Um, as I was saying, the venting that you see on the vehicle is totally normal. That's just some of the super chilled, densified liquid oxygen uh, uh, just vaporizing as it comes into contact and vents from the vehicle. And coming up, we'll also hear the call for Dragon to configure for terminal count, and then it will be transferred over to internal power. And then we'll hear that propellant tanks on Falcon 9 are getting ready to pressurize, which helps add some additional rigidity and structural support as we get ready for a strong back retract. That strong back will retract a couple of degrees at first, and then we will see it swing open completely uh, just shortly or at the moment of liftoff. Falcon 9 tanks will be pressurizing for strong back retract. And there's that indication that we are preparing for that strong back retraction. Coming up in just a few seconds, we should hear that Dragon is in terminal count. Dragon is in configured for terminal count. All right, there we heard that call. Dragon onboard computers have now taken control of the vehicle. As I mentioned before, first stage locks or liquid oxygen loading is underway and will wrap up at T minus three minutes. The second stage will wrap its locks load at T minus two minutes. Launch teams continue to report no issues and everything remains green and for an on-time launch. Has started. And here in just a couple seconds, you might be able to see the strong back arm as it does begin to retract. As Kate said, it will recline two degrees. We can just barely make out the, the, clamp, the clamp arms are now beginning to move. All right, now that those clamp arms are removed, as Sandra said, this will retract by two degrees. Uh, and then at liftoff, the strong back will retract another to 45 degrees, uh, allowing Falcon 9 to clear. Strong back is part of the transporter erector, and the transporter erector is what provides uh, the liquids, the gases, the electrical connections to the vehicle. It's also what we use to integrate the vehicle in its horizontal position, and we can see that two degree retraction just now. And the next call out that we should hear in about 20 seconds is that the first stage locks load is complete. Stage one, locks load is complete. And there we go, all of the oxidizer loaded on stage one. Soon we'll hear that stage two locks load is complete and that will be the last propellant call out we'll hear today. Now less than three minutes until launch. Dragon is in terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there we heard the good news that Dragon is now on internal power. Again, the white clouds that you see there at the base of the dragon trunk, totally normal. That's just the vapor uh, from the liquid oxygen. Again, second stage now wrapping up its lock load. Excuse me, first stage wrapping up its lock load um, just a few minutes ago, and now moving toward wrap up of second stage lock load, which will complete at T minus two minutes. Coming up on two minutes until liftoff, standing by for word that stage two locks load has been completed. Dragon is in auto idle. Stage two locks load is complete. There we heard the call out. Falcon 9 is now completely fueled. Uh, all of its propellants. So yeah, close out. So our starting, expect loud ending. All of its propellants, and we can see that leftover liquid oxygen uh, now being vented or released, uh, now flowing further away from the vehicle. So 
nearly 1 million pounds of liquid oxygen in RP-1 now on board Falcon 9. It is fully loaded and ready for launch. And coming up at T minus one minute, we'll hear that Dragon is in countdown. Its flight computer will switch to countdown mode and we'll hear that the flight termination system on Falcon 9 is SPS armed. SPS is armed, Falcon 9 is in startup and is now controlling. And there you heard it, Dragon's, Dragon is in countdown. Dragon's flight computer in countdown, the flight termination system now armed. We should get the final go for launch from SpaceX launch director Mark Sirtis. SpaceX. Godspeed. Go for launch. SpaceX Dragon. Go for launch. SpaceX reports go. Seconds. Crew reports go. 30 seconds until liftoff. T-minus 15. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Ignition. Engine's full power. And let's go. We're in the second and final abort mode for the first stage, continuing to get good performance. The crew is already pulling over two Gs. And next up is going to be a couple of events in rapid succession. First will be engine chill on the second stage and back engine. And there you heard that call out. And then we'll have Miko or main engine cutoff where the nine engines igniting will cut off in preparation for second stage separation. Then we'll see the single Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage ignite and continue to carry the Crew-5 astronauts to orbit. Just like we did on first stage, that MVAC chill is intended to help pre-chill the hardware prior to the full flow of that densified liquid oxygen. Stage one throttle down. At this point in time, those nine Merlin engines are beginning to throttle down in preparation for MECO or main engine cutoff. Standing by for MECO. And MECO. Stage two alpha. And Stage separation confirmed. Copy two alpha. There we should see that second engine begin to ignite now. And obviously confirmed by the loud cheer behind us here at Mission Control Hot Board. And we're also in two Alpha 40 aborts if needed. Again, second stage is lit and continuing to carry the Crew-5 astronauts into orbit. We're now getting a view of the first stage uh, after that stage separation. The second stage is still being illuminated by that single Merlin vacuum engine, and that's on the right-hand side of your screen. First stage on the left-hand side of your screen, making its way back to Earth. We will be attempting to land it on our drone ship, um, which today we are using just read the instructions. Acquisition signal, review it up. Stage 
And we did hear that acquisition of the ground station in Bermuda. The first stage is continuing to make its way back to Earth, and the second stage is going Great. to continue. Trajectory nominal. Another good call. Trajectory nominal. Captain copy. Confirmation there from Commander Nicole Mann. You can also sort of see the, the Space Coast there in the background of the first stage on the left-hand side of your screen. It also looks like you can actually see the thrust plume uh, created by the first stage as it's now rotating just out of screen. Second stage is going to continue firing until a little over eight minutes into the flight, really doing the heavy lifting now, getting the crew into orbit. Everything continues to look nominal on both first and second stages. As I mentioned before, the first stage will be making uh, a, a landing on one of our drone ships, which is currently parked a couple hundred miles off the coast of Florida in the Atlantic Ocean. So we can see now that... Good confirmation there that we have good trajectory. The second stage now traveling over 5,400 miles per hour. Crew is pulling a little more than one G right now. That's going to continue to ramp up, peaking just before we get to second stage cutoff here in just a few minutes from now. First stage will be performing two separate burns, a re-entry burn where we reignite three of the Merlin back, or excuse me, the Merlin M1D engines on the first stage. Uh, we ignite the center engine into radial, radial engines to help slow it down as it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. And then the second final burn, and that will be the landing burn on our drone ship. And the single M back engine Great. that you see. Trajectory the single M back engine that you see on the right of your screen is continuing to fire. We did hear another call out that trajectory is nominal. Crew heading in the direction that they are supposed to be. This single engine can produce over 220,000 pounds of thrust in the vacuum of space. Now over 200 kilometers in altitude. We will start to hit events now in a rapid succession as the first stage continues to make its way back to Earth and the second stage continues its burn. Just a couple minutes left in that burn. For those of you just joining us, just over six and a half minutes ago, uh, our four Crew-5 astronauts launched from Kennedy Space Center in Florida and they are now making their way into orbit on the second stage inside Dragon. Crew Dragon. Which we're hearing that the trajectory on that is nominal. Uh, Dragon copy. They are in, safe inside uh, Dragon Endurance, whereas the first stage on the left hand side of your screen uh, is making its way back to Earth. We are coming up to the re entry burn, which, as I said before, we ignite three of the nine Merlin engines to help slow the booster down as it re enters the dense part of the Earth's atmosphere. As the entry burn completes, we'll be in the Stage final... Stage one, entry burn startup. So there we heard the call out. You can there see it on your screen that that entry burn has been initiated. And as that entry burn completes, we'll be in the final um, different abort phases here shortly, which essentially correspond to areas along the very northeastern seaboard of the U.S. Stage and then, one entry burn shut down. Great news, that entry burn was shut down. And then those last all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, Atlantic off the coast of Scotland for those abort zones. Everything continues to look nominal for both the first and second stage stages. And the crew with the second stage still attached is now traveling over 13,000 miles per hour. We're about 10 seconds away from Seco 1. Copy, Shannon. 
Shannon, that call out. That call out for Shannon, Ireland, indicative of our final abort zone. After this, we'll see second stage shut off, and we'll be listening for confirmation of a good orbit, which tells us the crew and Dragon are exactly and where they need to be. Down. There we had confirmation that the MVAC has shut down simultaneously. Uh, the entry. And you heard that call for a good insertion. We will coast for a few minutes. There we can see the drone ship coming into view as Falcon 9 Launch attempts. The stage one landing leg deploy. You can see those landing legs have now deployed. And as you can see on your screen, and you can hear by the clapping and cheering behind me, Falcon 9 has landed on our drone ship just with the instructions, parked off the coast of Florida. And again, that second stage separation will be coming up just a couple of minutes now. We do coast for a few minutes after second engine cutoff to allow any rates to or motion to dampen out and settle. And looks like we're gonna get a view of the second stage as it separates here shortly. We did hear that the crew has been successfully inserted into a good orbit. Again, the crew is still attached to the second stage. We are expecting stage separation to occur in just over a minute from now, about one minute and eight seconds. And that's when the, uh, excuse me, when the second stage will separate from the dragon trunk. The dragon trunk is the part of hardware where we are able to house the uh, cargo that is able to be exposed to the vacuum of space as well as the solar panels, which help power Dragon while it is on orbit. Again, that stage separation is now coming up in about 30 seconds. After stage separation, we will have nose cone deployment. Now that Dragon is in the vacuum of space, we're able to, we will be able to open the nose cone and expose that forward hatch, which is what is utilized to dock uh, autonomously with the International Space Station. And that nose cone does stay closed for the flight up hill to help protect all of the guidance, navigation, and control sensors. We are standing by for second stage separation. And there is separation. Dragon separation confirmed. Dragon, this is your launch director. Dragon, launch director on Dragon on behalf of the entire launch and recovery team. It was an honor and a pleasure to be a part of this mission with you. And while October 3rd may belong to the main girls, October 5th will forever belong to Crew 5. Godspeed endurance. Cheers. Awesome. Thank you so much to the Falcon team. That was a smooth ride up here. we got three rookies that are pretty happy to be floating in space right now. And one a veteran astronaut who's pretty happy to be back as well. Let's see what you got to say, Kluge. Uh, soccer team, uh, you know, it was a smooth ride, and uh, I see all the three happy faces here back in Zero G, and I appreciate all the help to give us a smooth ride and training, and thank you so much. Thank you for your support. Anya.
Thank you, Falcon 9 and uh, our federal uh, agencies, uh, to Road Cosmos, NASA, and JAXA, and C6 exactly for uh, giving us that opportunity. We so glad to do it together. And uh, thank you for everybody, for all people who with us. Спасибо большое всем агентам Road Cosmos, NASA, JAXA и, естественно, SpaceX за предоставленную нам возможность. Мы рады всем экипажам делать то, что мы сейчас делаем. И большое спасибо всем людям, кто сейчас с нами. Some really nice words there from the Crew 5 crew, as well as... Hey, Dragon Falcon 9, see you. Thanks for the words. Uh, had a great ride. Have a good mission. We'll see you later. A wonderful Mean Girls reference there by Launch Director uh, Mark Soltis, and then we just heard from Chief Engineer Dan Alex. And we just heard our first Quindar tone. Indicating the crew is in space. Humidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. Expected loss of signal, New Hampshire. Dragon copy. And Kate, it did look like we were getting our first views of that microgravity indicator. I did see that as well. <laughs> And we're getting views now of the crew on orbit, three of them for the first time ever. We saw some cheers, some high fives. Looks like they're feeling great. Hopefully we can see that zero G indicator float back into view and hopefully get a better shot of it. I couldn't quite tell what it was, although it kind of looked like it may have been an Einstein doll. Uh, but that's just kind of what it looked like from the, the backside. I think you're right, Kate. It looked like a baby Einstein to me. <laughs> <laughs> so the next milestone that we're looking ahead towards is the nose cone opening. If you've just joined us, joined us, we had a successful liftoff uh, exactly 16 minutes ago of the Crew-5 mission. Uh, they had an on-time liftoff from Kennedy Space Center at noon Eastern time. They had a smooth ride up to orbit. The first stage landed successfully on our drone ship. Uh, just read the instructions, and everything has been looking good so far. Uh, we are hoping to get another view on board Dragon uh, once we're able to get that camera back. Uh, but so far, uh, you know, everything leading up to this point in time, we got a shot there of the uh, MVAC engine, which is no longer firing. It is uh, coasting um, with that sec it's attached to the second stage which has been separated from Dragon. Um, yeah, so everything was super smooth this morning, uh, starting all the way back. Uh, I think we got here around T minus four hours and uh, super smooth countdown, a beautiful day from Kennedy Space Center. It looked like a, a gorgeous view uh, from where Daryl and Bob were sitting. Uh, but yeah, we are uh, standing by for the nose cone opening. Now that the Dragon spacecraft is in space, we are able to- Expected loss of signal, in Finland. We are able to open up that uh, nose cone and expose the forward hatch, which is what is utilized to autonomously uh, dock with the International Space Station, but of course to protect that hardware that as well. As well as uh, protect the uh, guidance and navigation control hardware. Uh, we keep that nose cone closed during uh, launch preparations and during the ascent portion. So, uh, as you can see, saw there uh, momentarily, uh, Dragon is in space, and uh, the crew four, or excuse me, the crew five astronauts, all four of them are um, floating, uh, or they will be able to float soon. Uh, we're hoping to get another view of that zero G indicator once we're able to bring cabin. Uh, onboard cabin views uh, back to you of the Crew-5 crew. Uh, we always like to see what the uh what the zero-g gravity indicator is, as you saw earlier in the web webcast, uh, Bob actually brought uh, the zero-g indicator that he and Doug used on the Demo-2 mission, uh, a lovely sequin dinosaur, which I also have one at my desk, not the uh, 
Bob obviously has the one that went to space. Mine is a replica. Uh, but we love seeing these zero-G indicators. It's a really nice way to connect uh, those of us on ground with the folks up in space. So as I said before, we are anticipating uh, nose cone deployment shortly. Uh, just you can do a quick check-in. And although we can see now uh, the nose cone, the hooks have been released, and we see that nose cone moving with a pretty up-close shot. We're continuing to see that nose cone open and as, signal line. as we've mentioned, this does uncover a number of critical systems for the flight up to the space station that will be required for docking. There are six hooks that hold the nose cone in place during the launch and ascent portions. Those have begun to retract and the nose cone is beginning to swing open. The nose cone is about two-thirds of the way open at this time, so we do expect it to be fully open here shortly. Shortly after nose cone deployment, the crew will be able to get their visors open and they'll be given the okay to get out of their suits, and that will allow them to settle in for their ride to the International Space Station. It is about a 29-hour journey for the crew from launch to docking to the space station. But as you said, they'll be able to get out of their suits, get comfortable, get some rest, and just enjoy being in the microgravity environment of space. Again, we have three first-time flyers and one veteran on today's flight. But I'm sure it was an exciting moment. No matter how many times you've been to space, I can't imagine that it ever gets old. I would probably agree with that. Um, I would also imagine that the three first-time space goers will have a brief period of acclimation to gravity. I know I certainly would, and I also recognize that my period probably wouldn't be very brief in order to get acclimated to that lack of gravity. Um, but yeah, this is something that um, the veteran um, astronauts on board station uh, are you know, always happy to help uh, really introduce the, the new space goers uh, to the new environment. Absolutely. And we did also hear that there was good service section Draco checkouts that took place. We are standing by for that nose cone to be fully deployed, but it should be coming here momentarily. Dragon, we see a nominal nose cone opening, TCS and forward bulkhead Draco checkouts. Dragon copies. Next burn is a the upcoming phase burn per your displays. We see the phase burn in 28 minutes. Good readback. So you heard it there. The nose cone has fully been opened successfully. We had some good checkouts on the Draco thrusters, on the service section Draco thrusters, rather. And we also had nominal forward bulkhead checkouts. That's right, and the astronauts should be getting the okay to doff or remove their suits uh, in about six or seven minutes. Uh, I would imagine that, um, as Sandra mentioned before, we do have three space newbies on board today. I would imagine that they would be pretty excited to get out of their seats. They've been in, uh, in these seats for a while. Uh, the crew ingressed hours ago, and uh, if I would imagine that the three folks and, uh, and even the veteran, everybody would be excited to get out and uh, be able to float around a little bit for the first time on this Crew-5 mission. Yes, absolutely. And you do see the crew working through some procedures there on the touch pads that they do have in front of them. They'll continue to have those available for them throughout their flight uphill. Again, this is going to be about a 29-hour launch to docking for Crew-5.
it seems as though that zero G indicator may have floated out of view, perhaps up above the crew displays. We can see that the visors are up. Dragon SpaceX, environments are looking good for suit doffing. For today, we can leave the uh, camera configured for a little while longer, but at this time, you are go for 4.012 and 4.300. As a reminder, please stow the suits with the visors closed. I'll copy. Okay, Dragon copies. We are go for 4.012 and 4.300. We're going to keep the cameras configured, and when we stow the suits, we'll do it with the visors closed. Good readback. At this time, you're also go to tell the world a little bit about that stowaway we saw shortly after second engine cutoff. So we're standing by from a few words. So standing by for a few words from the crew about that zero-G indicator. And there it is. Back to the dragon, up back in the ground. We missed the last part of your trip. And no worries, repeating my last one there, I was going to uh, have you all talk a little bit about your zero-G indicator, uh, but we can hold that off for the next uh, ground station pass here for Dubai. Uh, at this time, what I'll do is I'll take the cameras external for suit doffing, and then uh, you let me know when we're allowed to come back on board. Okay, Dragon copies, so we'll let you know when you come back on with the cameras, and we're excited to talk about our uh, show right here. Okay, here. Dragon copies, and work. And it does sound like we are in a brief expected loss of signal with the crew. This does happen from time to time when we're in between our satellites, but we will have views and communication back with them here shortly. And we're looking forward to hearing their words on their stowaway and what that special meaning is for the crew. So with Crew 5 now successfully on orbit, let's head over to our counterparts at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Daryl, it was spectacular to watch this launch from here in Hawthorne, but tell me, what was it like to see it on the ground? <laughs> it was amazing. First of all, we got an idyllic day right here uh, on the Space Coast. I mean, the temperatures are like, uh, you know, mid-70s. There's a cool breeze. Phenomenal launch. Bob, I want to get your thoughts. You've flown. You've watched. This was pretty perfect. No, this was just outstanding. It was picturesque, you know, with the blue sky, the blue background, uh, a beautiful day here in Florida. The only thing I, I, I wish was that I was there with them because that is the one place that is better to watch a launch from uh, than right here at the Kennedy Space Center is on board the rocket ship. I got to believe that. And uh, though we weren't on board, we did get to watch the views as we were going up and saw them land the booster, which, by the way, that booster also going to be SpaceX's and NASA's crew six booster so more the reuse nasa taking advantage of that as well absolutely every chance that we get to reuse a a capsule or reuse a booster kind of drives down cost and uh increases the opportunity for more folks to fly in space now i'm headed out uh, to take a swim right i mean this <laughs> is just perfect out here bob thank you for your thoughts um and now we're going to move on we've got an interview here with uh Robin Gatens, the director of the International Space Station, who also joins us here. And you got to experience the launch from right here uh, outside the, the press site. And I want to ask you, how did you enjoy it? Well, it's always exciting to see launch to the International Space Station. I've seen many, but uh, especially uh, to see an, a new international crew uh, headed to the International Space Station was, was very exciting. And of course, 
you, you nailed it. Beautiful day. Really glad we, we got this one off today. Absolutely. And they'll make that 29 hour transit to the space station. Uh, you're the director of the International Space Station. So I want to ask you, I, I heard there's a book coming out uh, that's, uh, I, there have been books before about the International Space Station, but a new one's coming out. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's called Our Benefits to Humanity. Uh, it is a publication we have put out before, and we actually released it in July, so it's out. Uh, it's both in print format as well as online, so uh, people can just search on Benefits to, uh, for Humanity, International Space Station, and find that book. And it highlights uh, all of the wonderful research that's going on on the space station. This crew will be doing over 200 experiments during their time on the International Space Station, ranging from uh, medical uh, kinds of research that, that will help treat diseases and, and produce uh, new, new drugs uh, here on Earth, regenerative medicine. One day we might even uh, print uh, organs uh, for transplant on Earth. We have Earth science going on on space station, a number of climate instruments to help us um, understand Earth's climate, uh, really exciting results. This is truly uh, what we call the decade of results on the International Space Station, where uh, we're, we're, we're building on past uh, lessons and capabilities to just uh, compound the results that we're able to get out of the space station. And 235 investigations, 76 new ones, and you mentioned the decade two decades, more than two decades, the yes. International Space Station has been operating. You mentioned some of the science that they're going to be doing. I'm wondering if you have a favorite that you've kind of identified, like, oh, I can't wait to find out the results of that. Well, I've been tracking a lot of them. Um, I'm really excited about some of the medical uh, things. Uh, we're flying again a, uh, a payload by a company called Lamb Division, and they're producing uh, retinal implants that could be used to uh, help uh, patients with um, ocular degeneration. Uh, so that's really exciting. I'm excited about uh, what we're learning, um, you know, with respect to the climate. We've got brand new climate instruments up on board. Um, we've got companies learning how to make better products through their research on, uh, through the ISS uh, National Lab. Um, and their, their work on the space station. So um, I'm also excited about plant research going on on mm -hmm. space station. I think that's not only important for future exploration missions, but also to help us grow plants in harsh environments, small spaces here on Earth. And also NASA, while doing all of that, is continuing to work towards its ultimate goal of uh, getting to the moon, going back to the moon and sustaining our presence there. A lot of technology. Uh, at the station that works towards that end. We want to actually pause, though, for one second because we understand that one of the astronauts, uh, Josh Cassida, has a statement that he is going to uh, make. Uh, it, uh, it is relatively about uh, his zero-G indicator, which if you saw in the coverage, it was, uh, I don't know if it was a baby Einstein, Bob, but it was a little Einstein. It definitely <laughs> looked like a small Einstein, but we'll listen to Josh and hear exactly the details. Let's listen in. Again, waiting for astronaut Josh Cassida with a special message. And Dragon, cameras are internal. Space next station. Dragon copies, we are internal with the waistbands off and stand by for the cabin mic check. You see Koichi Wakata is out of his seat. Yeah, this is SpaceX Dragon from the cabin mic com check. And Koichi, I've got you five by five, how me? We have you loud and clear also. Great news, and we're also getting some great views inside the capsule here. So if you all want to get a chance to talk about your indicator, we'd all love to hear some. A 
Absolutely, Mike. So, uh, a couple of years after he come up with his groundbreaking theory of special relativity, Albert Einstein, in his mind, still had a couple loose ends to tie up. While he was sitting in the patent office, because he wasn't famous yet, definitely should have been, he had what his happiest thought of his entire life. That thought was, person in free fall doesn't feel their own weight. That thought, along with some others that he built upon, led to general relativity and our understanding of gravitation and curvature of space-time. We're experiencing Einstein's happiest thought continuously, like the International Space Station has been doing for over 20 years. On Crew 5, call this little guy our free fall indicator. We're here to tell you there's plenty of gravity up here. In fact, that's what's keeping us in orbit right now and preventing this trip on a Crew Dragon from being a one-way trip. A little bit like life. We live in the same world. We live in the same universe. Sometimes we experience it in a very different way from our neighbors. We can all keep that in mind. Hopefully we can all continue to do an absolutely amazing thing. Do it together. Well, that was excellent, Josh. We appreciate you all taking the chance to share with us some of those special words and some of the meaning to you all. I'll tell you, my crewmates are just happy that uh, we didn't break out a dry erase board and get into more detail. <laughs> we'll chat lensing later. Absolutely. A message from okay, at this time. astronaut Josh Cassida, the pilot of Crew-5, and his fellow astronauts and cosmonaut floating in space high above the Earth as they head to the International Space Station with a special message about Albert Einstein, who is represented there floating around space as the zero-G indicator, but then also a nod to his uh, theory of relativity. E equals MC squared, I believe, Bob. <laughs> well, there are a lot of great things that Einstein was responsible for, and uh, I would just say that uh, maybe there are five folks uh, experiencing his uh, happiest thought on board uh, the Dragon capsule just right now. Absolutely, and NASA is looking to return humans to the surface of the moon, and this is part of it, going to the International Space Station. We mentioned some of the efforts in, uh, in going up there, and, of course, the science that's going to be done by Crew-5. We're looking forward to that as well. Some final thoughts, uh, Bob, about the day today. Well, it was just a wonderful day, a chance for me to relive the launch experience with the Falcon 9 and the Dragon capsule, and I'm just super excited for the uh, the Crew-5 uh, and little Einstein uh, on board and in free fall right now. A very special moment indeed. Before we wrap up, I want to send it over to Megan Cruz, who is with Deputy Administrator and former Space Shuttle astronaut Pam Melroy. I am Pam, and I have just been chatting about how wonderful of a day this was for a launch. Oh, it, it's a gorgeous day yes. here at the historic Kennedy Space Center. For me to see the next generation of launch vehicles launching to the space station was thrilling. And also the next generation of, of young explorers. You know, you and I were talking about a young boy here, guys, that bought a, a, a space <laughs> suit, an astronaut suit from downstairs at our, our, uh, our store and was wearing it around and running around. How cute was that to see him so excited? Well, I found it pretty cute to see the three rookies who were on the flight, as well as my very dear personal friend, Koichi Wakata, who I flew with in 2000 to the wow. space station. So I'm inspired by both the young and the experienced. And speak to me about that, That, like you said, you, you've flown on the space shuttle three times. Talk to me about that ascent, how it must feel as they're going up through the atmosphere. It's absolutely a remarkable experience. And I found myself thinking as I was looking at the, the schedule for this uh, rocket, how physics drives so much of what we do. So it's very similar in the timing of everything, uh, but uh, the space shuttle was a little bit of a wild ride, I have to say. It had a lot of vibration, particularly the first two minutes. Um, but, you know, it's a very different experience when you're here on the ground. Uh, it always brings tears to my eyes. I pray for the crew. When you're inside the vehicle, 
You're having a blast. <laughs> so I'm glad to hear that they were having a blast. Uh, talk to me about why these commercial crew missions are so important. Well, they're really important to us for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the whole value that NASA brings uh, to the American people and, in fact, to humanity is around science, uh, uh, a strong science and technology posture for the country, and inspiration. And uh, we see that all wrapped up in commercial crew because we see the ability to do more science on orbit yes. because we can carry more crew members. We see the advancements that have been made through NASA investments in commercial crew and commercial cargo that are lifting our entire space industry. And of course, there's nothing better than seeing an astronaut fly to space for inspiration. Sure. And what's next for NASA? You know, right behind us, we have the vehicle assembly building. Inside is NASA's Artemis One rocket. Are you excited for that? Oh, I'm, I'm very excited. I'll tell you, it's a big deal when a new rocket flies for the first time. And uh, we have learned a lot. We, we have a lot to learn, just like I was a test pilot. So when we flew airplanes, uh, we never actually launched the first try. Usually we just taxied down the runway. <laughs> so we've, we've taken her out to the runway a couple of times now, and we've learned a lot. And I cannot wait to see the most powerful rocket in the world launch going to the moon. Yeah, we're doing a lot of great stuff here, and we're so happy to bring viewers on the ride with us, right? You bet. <laughs> That's the whole idea. NASA shares and inspires. Perfect. Pam, thank you so much. I appreciate you being here. Guys, we're going to send it back to you for the last time today. Thank you very much, Megan. Great job out there. Appreciate it. And Nicole, Josh, and Koichi and Anna are now on course to arrive at the International Space Station around 4.57 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow. And, of course, NASA TV will stay on the air for continuous live coverage along Crew-5's entire ride to station. Meanwhile, SpaceX's YouTube channel will join live coverage starting at roughly two hours prior to docking. And though our coverage here at Kennedy is coming to a close. We will turn it over to the team in Houston to take us through the next phases of the Crew-5 mission all the way through the arrival at the International Space Station. For those of you watching online on NASA's YouTube, make sure you take a look at the description below. You'll see the video link there, and you'll find that for Crew-5 Coast Phase. Live coverage will continue at that link shortly. You can see it at the bottom of your screen. Pull that up for you. If you're watching on NASA TV, you won't notice a thing, and coverage will continue. So a post-launch news conference is scheduled for 1.30 p.m. Eastern time on NASA TV. And you can find mission updates on Twitter, at NASA, at SpaceX, and on the web at NASA.gov, including timing on any potential live tours of Dragon uh, Endurance during the trip to station. Now, before we sign off, from Kennedy, I want to thank my partner and co-host, Bob Bankin, for being on the launch broadcast, sharing your incredible insight and experiences. Bob, I really enjoyed listening to you today. Thank you so much to you and to Megan, your wife, who helped us with Crew 4. Uh, we look forward uh, to hearing more from uh, your family, as well as uh, maybe seeing Theo on a, on a future <laughs> launch broadcast. Well, well thank you, Daryl. I, I very much appreciate that. And, of course, thank you to my wife and uh, my son and our dog, Shadow, for joining us uh, for a short period of time during the during today's broadcast. And, uh, again, I just want to echo uh, Deputy Administrator Pam Morroy's words with, uh, it's been an exciting year. Uh, the Crew-5 folks are, are just getting started on their excitement for the year, if you will, on their way to the space station right now. But we've got an Artemis uh, One rocket over there, the SLS, and the Vehicle Assembly Building. Looking forward to seeing that back out on the pad and uh, getting her launched later this year. Coming to a launch pad soon, mid-November, we all hope, and uh, we're looking forward to that as well immensely. Huge thanks to all of our guests for joining us today, and thank you to all of you for watching. Here now are the highlights from the journey we took today. And just a reminder from here at the Kennedy Space Center to keep looking up. They're getting suited up inside that historic suit up room. Everything going smoothly. And there they are. The astronauts of Crew 5 taking their first steps outside. Engines full power and lift off.